Well, good morning once again. And if you would grab a Bible, we're going to head to the book of Psalms in just a few moments for part three, even though it's week two. So part two, I did this morning at the uh, pavilion for, for our service uh, together with the community. And we'll do part three at this time. And so if you're grabbing your Bibles, we're going to go to chapter 122, Psalm 122. As we continue to look at these Psalms of Ascent, and they're titled so because the ancient Hebrews would make their journey three times a year for different celebrations, and they would head to the, the city of God, to Jerusalem. And no matter where they were coming from, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, whatever direction they were coming from, they all had the same journey in that they were all ascending. They were all going up in elevation. And so if you think of a journey, how many of you ever hiked maybe a, a large hill or a mountain? I'm not talking like the hill over here on River Street or something like that. <laughs> but, but you've hiked a hill or a mountain, okay? And, and it can be quite a journey, right? And it can be daunting. And, and so there were songs that they would sing along the way, not just because of the, the treacherousness of ascending the hill and the, the mountain of God, but also in preparation for an encounter with God and God's people. And so they would be preparing their hearts as they went. As I shared last Sunday, these Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, not only can be looked at as Psalms that they sang on their pilgrimage, their sacred destination, going to the city of God, but psalms that can help us in our understanding of what it means to be a pilgrim now, to be a disciple now. Understanding that we are on a sacred destination. That the earth is not our home. And so along the way, there are four words that I think will be helpful for us to understand in this journey. I shared them with you last week. I'm going to share them with you once again. And uh, if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to take out your teaching notes from the bulletin. And as you do so, you can note that I provided the notes from this morning. So if you were there this morning, that should look pretty familiar. And if you weren't there this morning, you have something else that you can go back later this afternoon and kind of read through and reflect on. And you can read the Psalms that are listed there and, and uh, see the, the points that were made this morning. And some of you will already notice, if you're looking at the notes for this morning's message earlier, you'll note that there's a typo. Anybody catch it? I think it was in the word reference. It's missing a letter. And some of you are looking and you're going to try to figure it out. So just so you know, I know that I messed up. Okay? It happens. You can mark it down on your calendar. Pastor Len messed up. Now, you do realize that there will be many other mistakes along the way. And some of you, you've been around me long enough. you like, we forgot. We, we kept keeping track, right? Of how many times I mess up. But here's the, here are the four words. Repentance, which we looked at last week. And we learned that the journey is a journey of grace. So, so there's some words that will go along with these four words. That will help us understand more about what's really going on. But we talked about last week that it's a journey of grace. So we understand. And the pilgrims, as they made their journey to the city of God, would be reminded of their own need, their sinfulness, their need for forgiveness, that the world is not right, but more than the world not being right, they are not right, their heart is not right, that they need a fresh encounter with a loving, forgiving God, and they need to seek His grace. And so they would be reminded as they made their journey that it is a journey of grace. And we as disciples now, we need to be reminded that it is a journey of grace. This morning at our community service, we talked about this journey also being a journey of dependence, that we need to really rely on the Lord, that we need to trust in the Lord, that we need to put our hope in the Lord. And so we, we learn today that it's not just a journey of grace, but it's a journey of hope, that as those ancient pilgrims made their journey, that they would be again filled with hope, 
that there would be a fresh sense and, and a heightened hope in their lives. That maybe hope had kind of drained out a little bit, but as they made their ascent to the hill of God, that they would be once again filled with the hope of a relationship with him and what that provides as they focused on his greatness and his goodness. And now today I want to look at that it's also reverence, that reverence is a very vital, important part of our journey with the Lord. This is a theme throughout these Psalms of Ascent. And we're going to look at three different chapters, not entirely uh, every, every chapter or every part of each of these three chapters, but different spots where we'll see how important it is that we reverence, that we revere the name of the Lord, that we worship him. And so not only is it a journey of grace, it's a journey of hope, but it's also a journey of worship. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll finish up our series on Ascend and look at perseverance and how we need to persevere, how we need to keep going. Because again, it is a, it is a climb. It is a journey. It's not over usually just like this. And it's usually not easy, so we have to persevere and we'll talk about that next week. But let's jump into chapter 122. If you have your Bibles, love for you to be able to follow along, uh, smartphone, etc. And again, the words will be on the screen. And as I mentioned last week, the words that are in blue, when you see scripture in blue, that is from the message. So the words in white are from the New International Version. The words in blue are from the message. As I mentioned uh, in the teaching notes, a great resource to follow along, to read also as we go through this series is a book written by Eugene Peterson called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. He wrote it several years ago uh, based on these psalms. And so each chapter deals with one of the chapters in these Psalms of Ascent. And a well-written book, and a book that'll make you think, a book that I believe that'll help you grow in your walk with the Lord. And uh, so I'd encourage you to, to pick that up and however uh, you choose to, to read, whether it's a, a Kindle or whatever. Um, and Eugene Peterson, as many of you would know, went on to write, to translate, to paraphrase God's Word in what we know as the message. And so I'm, I'll be reading different times from the message as well. First one, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. And so whether they were singing this song when they actually arrived or when they're singing this song on the way there, picturing and, and just thinking of being in God's presence and celebration and joy would fill their heart. This is what they're seeing. The message, I, I like how it says that when they said, let's go to the house of God, my heart leapt for joy. And now we're here, O Jerusalem, inside Jerusalem's walls. But as I read that, I can't help but wonder when somebody says to you, let's go to church this morning, how you respond. Does your heart leap for joy or does it fall in disappointment oh I was hoping to sleep in today does, does your heart leap for joy or does it shrink in horror oh no what's pastor going to say today how's he going to step on my toes today or what, what's going to you know does it shrink in horror? Or does it just kind of stall in apathy? Does your heart just kind of... Get, uh, it's not really a big deal, but it's not like I'm thrilled to go. I hope, I hope that when somebody says to you, or when you wake up and you realize, you remember that it's Sunday, that there's a joy that fills your heart. I was happy. I was glad I was filled with joy. My heart leapt for joy when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Not, not because you can come and hear some good music. N not because you can come and, and hear some preaching and hopefully it's at least not bad. But because you can come 
and enter into the presence of the Lord. But here's the, the thing as we look at scripture, as we go through this. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. When it says Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together, it's not necessarily just talking about its size and how it's crowded and, and like just, we feel like a bunch of sardines. It's this idea of unity. It's this idea of being together. And that's one of the things that I love about meeting together and being able to gather together at least once a week to worship the Lord. That we can do it together. I, I love worshiping the Lord on my own. I, I love listening to praise music and spending time in prayer and reading God's word on my own. But there's just something special about joining in with others. For one thing, it's a lot better to listen to other people's voice than my own. But there's just, isn't there? I mean, would you agree? I, I, I just think there's something special about being with God's people. And that's part of the, the joy is we're going to worship the Lord together. There's unity in that. There's togetherness in that. And the psalmist is especially joyful about that and the opportunity to worship the Lord. As we look at this in the, the message, it says this, Jerusalem, well-built city, built a place for worship. Built as a place for worship. The city to which the tribes ascend. All God's tribes go up to worship, to give thanks to the name of God. This is what it means to be Israel. They all journey together. They all ascend to worship, to give thanks to the name of God. This is what it means to be Israel. And so the first thing that we can take from this is to be a pilgrim, is to be a worshiper. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're going to follow him, that automatically means that you should be a worshiper. Now, does that mean that you have to be able to play an instrument to be a worshiper? You know, David was a worshiper, and he, he played the harp or the lyre or whatever. He, he played instruments, and we have those that are worshipers that, that play instruments. I, I, can't, I can't play an instrument. I can play the radio, but I can't really play an instrument. Well, I, I can play the piano just a little bit. Did you guys know that? hard to say and prove it. How many of you want me to prove it? Yeah. You say prove it. All right. You ready? Watch out, Mason. I'm coming for you. Here it is. Ready? That's, that's all I got. I'm sorry. Uh, does it mean that you have to be a, a great singer to be a worshiper? I sure hope not. <laughs> Here, here's a, does, does it even mean that you have to enjoy music? Mm -mm. No. Nope. It, it's more about the heart than the vocal cords or about an instrument that you can play. Because worship is what? It's a lifestyle. It's living our life in reflection of who God is. It's a life, it's living our life in recognition of God's greatness and his goodness. Because he is great and because he is good, we live our lives in a way to honor him. And as we like to say it around here, we joyfully honor God with our lives. What a privilege it is to live our lives, to honor Him, that we would live for His glory. It's not about us. It's not about our name. It's not about our fame. It's about His name and His fame. To be a pilgrim is to be a worshiper. 
Psalm 122 continues, and it talks about King David, who had it in his heart to build a temple for the Lord, and though it wasn't him that built it, he laid a lot of the groundwork for its building. If you know the story, David said, I, I, I want to build a house for the Lord, and, and he, he sought the Lord, and the Lord said, nope. First, first of all, I don't even really need a house, just so you know. But second of all, you have blood on your hands. You are not fit to build my house. But your son Solomon will build it. And sure enough, Solomon used his dad's plans and a lot of the resources that his dad had already uh, put together and, and set aside and Solomon was blessed and God allowed Solomon to be able to add to that and they, they built a beautiful temple to worship the Lord. But as the pilgrims, the ancient Hebrew pilgrims would make their journey and they sing about David, they would also sing another song about the city of God and it being established and David and thinking about who David was and David's heart, particularly when it came to the building of the temple. And we see this in Psalm, let me give you the, the chapter. It's in your notes. You just look at your notes. You can find it. There's not that many to choose from. It says, Lord, remember David in all his self-denial. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. I, I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to do anything for myself. God is number one. Which leads us to the second lesson that we can learn from this. The pilgrim makes God their priority. The pilgrim makes God their priority. Not, not just to be a pilgrim is to be a worshiper. But we understand that God is our priority. Just like David made God his priority. A great reminder as the pilgrims made their journey... To be like David who made God their priority. And it would provide in, in many ways a reset for them as they made their journey to make sure that God was number one in their life. That God was their priority. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we have a tendency to allow other things to take number one in our lives. To kind of just work their way to the surface. Kind of like rocks in the field. Farmers know what I'm talking about. You get rid of those stinking things one year and you come back the next year and you get ready to plant and what do you have to do? You got to take care of those rocks once again and pick them up or pay somebody else to pick them up. And just, just like that in our own lives, when we're going through life, it, we just have this tendency that things kind of surface up and they become the priority. We're more focused on them than we are on God. We can become more focused on pleasing ourselves than pleasing the Lord. We can become more focused on pleasing a family member than pleasing the Lord. And so these three different times throughout the year that all of the Israelites would gather together to worship the Lord, it would provide a reset for them. And I think in part that's why God has given us the Sabbath, a Sunday, to provide a reset for us. To, to give us a reminder that the Lord should be number one. That he should be the priority. But sadly, if we're to be honest again with ourselves. If we're to really look at things. Is God always the priority? Is God always the priority when it comes to church attendance? When it comes to Sunday morning is God the priority or does it kind of depend on, well, it's a nice day and so I think I'll hit the, the golf links or I'll, I'll do this or we'll do that. There's other things that kind of come to the surface and it's not that they're bad things necessarily. It's just that they take the place of the Lord because they become our priority and instead of giving ourselves a reset and making sure that 
God as our focus for that day and the, the coming week, we push God aside and we've got these rocks in our lives instead. And so, just remember, the pilgrim makes God their priority. As we continue on, he goes on, and this is basically God's response as they talk about David and David's desire for uh, the temple to be built and they, they actually talk about the psalmist records some of Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple. This is God's response. He says, if your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. He goes on to say, I will bless her. Speaking of Jerusalem. Speaking of really the nation of Israel, I will bless her. And then verse 16, I will clothe her priests with salvation and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. But here's how the message has it. I'll shower blessings on the pilgrims who come here and give supper to those who arrive hungry. I'll dress my priests in salvation clothes. The holy people will sing their hearts out. I love that. They'll sing their hearts out. It, it, that kind of speaks to two things to me. Singing their heart out is, is like there's, they're full of passion, right? It's, it's not just, you think of singing their hearts out. Part of it is like, it's, it, maybe it's loud. It, it's passionate in expression, but it's, it's more than that. It's, it's from the heart. They're, they'll sing their heart out. There's people that'll sing their lungs out or their vocal cord out. But what God wants us to do is to sing our hearts out. And when we understand his goodness and his greatness, when we understand his blessing upon us, I don't understand how we wouldn't respond by praising him by singing our hearts out but more than just singing our hearts out by by worshiping him with all that we have not just in song or music but in everything that we do our very lives let's go to uh, Psalm 128 a great verse here Psalm 128 says blessed are all who fear the Lord who walk in obedience to him. We just looked at how God promised blessings upon those that, that obeyed him. That if, if David's descendants would obey him, would walk in his ways, that he would bless them. That he would shower blessings upon them and then they would in return respond by praising God by singing their hearts out. And here we see in chapter 128, verse 1, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to Him. The word blessed has been and can be translated as happy, but I think it's better to look at it as happy, happy. It goes beyond just what we think of as happy. You know, you, you get something in the mail, you get a card in the mail, you might be happy, Somebody gives you um, something that you've been wanting, you, you might be happy. But there's something that goes beyond that. It, it's really, it's joy. It's this idea of being blessed. It's the idea of being happy, 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 happy are all who fear the Lord. Well, we, we see that in Scripture, this idea of fearing the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Does that mean we, we cower, that we're afraid of him, that, that we don't, fear seems to indicate distrust, doesn't it? Fear seems to indicate that you got to watch out, you never know what it'll do. I, you've been around some dogs that are like that, right? You don't know how they're going to respond and so you, you keep an eye on them. How many, you, you know what I'm talking about? I, I like to do some walking in the mornings and, and there are some dogs in our community. Uh, thankfully, a couple of the dogs that I would encounter at different times have, have left uh, the, the community or at least the area where I walk uh, most mornings. But they, they came out there. One day they weren't, they weren't chained up. 
And I was walking and I saw them and I kind of keeping an eye and all of a sudden they're like right there. And I'm like, whoa, back up. And thankfully there was somebody coming down the hill. Miss Coach, some of you know her from, uh, from the high school. She was coming down the hill and she kind of drove her vehicle and got in between us and like kind of helped. And then the homeowner came out and like, so I, you better believe it. Every time I walk by that house from then on when those dogs were at that residence, like, whoa, I'm, I'm watching. Is that how we respond to God? Like, uh, okay, I, you, you kind of, I think you're nice. Or, you know, I think you might be okay. Like those dogs, they look nice. They look cool. They look like they could be dogs that I could enjoy, but I, I didn't trust them because of the way they responded to me, the way they were treating me. Like, is that how we, is that how we, how we approach God? I, I don't think so. Although there is reason there, we, we should certainly have reverence for him, right? The word that's used for fear here really is more of the idea of awe. To be in awe of who he is. To, to really understand how powerful he is. Now certainly those that are outside of Christ, those that are outside of faith, those that don't have hope, they, they, no, they don't have, and they're not on the journey of hope, there should be fear of your eternal consequences of, of what lies ahead unless you turn to the Lord and seek his salvation but those of us that are in Christ we don't need to be afraid of him just like just like I didn't need to be afraid of my dad growing up but you better believe that I had reverence for my dad because I understood that if I got out of line because he loved me he would help me get back in line and it usually was by applying pressure to a certain part of my anatomy and the more out of alignment that I was the more pressure he applied to my anatomy so I figured out pretty quickly that it's good to just walk in those in the within the boundaries and God has given us boundaries not because he's a mean God but because he's a loving God and here's the deal, when we obey Him, when we walk in obedience to Him, what happens? We live a blessed life. When you are walking in God's ways, you will be blessed. Here's kind of an equation. To worship God is to follow God. So flipped it around, if you're going to be a pilgrim, to be a pilgrim is to be a worshiper. To be a worshiper is to be a pilgrim. It's, it's you're going to follow him. If you really say, I worship God, and here's one of the things. This is where it, there's kind of a breakdown, in my opinion, and, and we've, we've already established today that I do make mistakes, right? So I could be wrong on this, but I don't think I am. We'll see what you think. I think in our civilization, there has been a huge disconnect between those who are worshipers and those who are followers. I think we have a lot of people that in our civilization, they love to worship God. They love singing. They love doing their music. They love when, when there's the band and they're just rocking it out and, and you'll see people with lifted hands and they would say they're worshiping God. We're worshiping God. But here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's, here's where we have the litmus test to see if we're really a true worshiper of God because to worship God is to follow God. If we're not following God, if we're not walking in obedience to the Lord, then I would suggest to you, and you can disagree, but just make sure that you're using scripture to do it. I would suggest to you that if you are not walking in obedience to the Lord, then you are not truly living a life as a worshiper of the Lord. You may sing the songs. You may play the music. You, you may put money in the offering plate. But if you're not walking in obedience to the Lord, 
You're not truly living as a worshiper. And if you're not doing that, then you're not actually living as a true disciple. Because to worship him is to follow him. But if we do that, if we worship him, we follow him, it will, live, it will lead to a life that is blessed. We will live blessed. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we're going to have a fat checking account or whatever? That, that our kids will never have any problems? No, that's not the guarantee. But, but there is something to this. And I think most of you would be able to to agree that when we do life God's ways it just works better relationships work better when you do them God's ways right I mean, it, it, just think about it when you love God with all that you have and you love your neighbor as yourself relationships tend to go better but when you are selfish when you think of yourself first when you put others down you don't treat them the way that you would want to be treated you speak to them rudely. You lie to them. You cheat them. What, what happens to those relationships? There's a huge disconnect. Trust breaks down. But when we live according to God's ways and we're obedient to Him and we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, it's, it's not that every single relationship is going to be hunky-dory, whatever that means. Because it's still on them to how they're going to respond. But by and large, we're going to be blessed. Our relationships are going to be blessed. When you parent out of godly principles, out of biblical principles, when you parent and you raise your children according to God's ways, by and large, your children will turn out much better. That's, that's what a number of these psalms talk about. Talk about how when we're focused on the Lord and we're living for Him and we're worshiping Him and we're honoring Him with our lives when we're walking in obedience, it sets the example to our children and so they follow that path. And we're blessed by that. What a blessing it is when our children walk in obedience to the Lord. When our children love the Lord. Financially, when we operate by God's principles... We tend to not buy things that we don't need to impress people that we don't even like. And we, we just live differently. And we aren't as likely to become in debt because we understand what Scripture talks about. That the borrower is slave to the lender. And when you're not in bondage financially, that's a pretty blessed life, right? Right? And so we just see that there, there are just some practical ramifications from living a life in obedience to the Lord as a worshiper, as a true follower of God. But understand this. This is not why we do this. We, we don't worship Him so that we can be blessed. That's not the why. That's just the bonus. Okay? I hope we can understand this. Because if you are living and, and trying to worship God just so that you'll be blessed, things are going to be off kilter. But if your focus is just to worship the Lord and to follow Him, to walk in obedience, it, it is biblical that you will have a life that is blessed. Right. And so I would encourage you to worship Him. But don't, don't just worship him like some worship him. Make sure that you're a, a follower, that you're walking in obedience. Because to worship him is to follow God, is to live blessed. I want to wrap it up with these two questions. Number one, is God your priority? Is God your priority? Now before you just either write down an answer or just kind of in your heart give an answer. I, I, I want you to really do some self-evaluation because that's what the pilgrims, the Hebrew pilgrims would be doing as they made their journey to Jerusalem. There would be some time for some, some real self-evaluation. 
Is God really my priority? Is God really the priority or are there some other rocks that have come to the surface that I need to clear out to make God, again, my priority? So is God your priority? You might want to just evaluate your commitment to the Lord by commitment to the church, commitment to attendance. Not that that's the, the only litmus test and not that that's even a guaranteed litmus test. But I think it can be helpful. Your commitment to living financially according to God's ways can be a pretty good test to whether or not God is really your priority. So number one, is God your priority? Number two, are you living in awe of God? Are you living in awe of God? Are you living day by day reflecting on who He is, reflecting on His greatness, remembering that He is the Lord Most High? I love that we've had this image and there's been a, a big push in the last, I don't know, whatever, 30 years or so to really help us to understand God more in a loving, uh, in a loving Father kind of way. And we have this great song that we've sung and we'll continue to sing, the Good, Good Father. And, and it's great to remember Him in that way and to, to approach Him and to know Him in that way, that He is a good, good Father. It's great to sing the song and to have the thought, what a friend we have in Jesus. I love that. But let us also not mistake that He is the great God. That He is the Almighty God. That He is the all-knowing, all-sufficient, all-powerful God. That He is a holy God. That He is a just God. Let us continue to, to walk in awe 